Thank you. I apologize for sitting in the back. That was probably a poor decision. You gotta walk all the way to the front. So um, let me make sure this is perfect. Um, so my name's Kyle Haas. Um, I am a, a clean energy program manager. Um, as Jonathan mentioned, um, I'm currently managing the bioenergy program here for the state. Um, I also work on solar PV projects, some workforce development projects, and a number of other efforts um, that we have going on at MEA. Um, as Abby and, uh, and everyone else in the office, we wear a lot of hats, um, so we try to make sure that we, uh, we focus on the low-hanging fruit, and I think that that's something that we're going to try to talk about specifically with this presentation here. So um, a key part of our, our responsibilities is to promote the commercialization um, of innovative technologies and, and bring them from workbenches and labs um, into and, and deliver them to the citizens of the state and, and businesses in the state. Um, so in these efforts, we, we strive to provide funding for commercially proven technologies. And I'll talk a little bit more about that um, specifically in a minute. But the key point there is um, we don't focus on research and development in most cases. We try to leverage state taxpayer funds as effectively as we can, um, identify opportunities, and, and leverage them into real economic opportunities. Um, so many of our Game Changers projects um, have been implemented in other states um, or in other countries or on other continents. Um, but for one reason or another, um, many of them have not been uh, adopted here in the state. So basically, um, what we are looking to do is we're looking to mitigate the costs and risks of some of these uh, energy generation technologies, lower the cost for the first adopters, um, so that the next generation will be less expensive as permitting has been undertaken, best practices have been established, and a lower cost can be um, enjoyed for those next uptakers. So the goal is not to just incent one project, but, but to really leverage that into the next series of projects when everybody sees how much money the first project is saving. We also look to jumpstart innovative technology industries of the future. Um, in this, we try to create jobs. We try to create small businesses. We try to incent businesses that um, have already been pretty successful, but uh, have a technology that can benefit the rest of the state, um, and provide case studies and success stories for future adopters. Um, finally, um, well, the last two things are to bring up economic benefits to the communities. Um, and I already spoke to for a moment about jobs and, and industries and to identify clean energy generation technologies and market strategies that then help us to meet the RPS goals. So um, through this program, we aim to guide technologies and in some cases companies through um, a term called valley of death. Uh, those of you who aren't necessarily in the um, renewable en energy industry kind of as a whole versus uh, focusing more strictly on uh, woody biomass, this is uh, more of an academic um, and I'll try to make it um, as not boring as possible. Um, but um, this is a major part of academic study of clean energy technologies. Um, in many cases, uh, the technology has been fully proven and implemented in uh, a number of other instances. Um, so as you can see, um, the first stage is, um, is kind of identifying that research and development area. And this represents the kind of cumulative profits. And then the second um, portion of the graph then represents uptake. So this is. Um, cash flow as well as basically effectiveness of the, of the business. Um, but one thing I want to make clear is that Game Changer grants are, are not for the portion um, of, of the product that represent uh, research and development. We really look to take those industries to the next level um, in deployment and then um, get them to the point where they're benefiting not only the, uh, the, the creator, um, but also the uptakers. Um, so basically, what we're looking to do is provide opportunities for economies of scale. And in this way, it benefits all future uptakers by buying down that first cost of implementation. So um, yeah, I, don't, I won't spend too much time on this, because uh, most of you are, uh, have more expertise um, on these uh, and, and know this better than I do. Um, but the, the key point is that the, uh, a resource exists. It's currently underutilized. And um, we need to find effective and uh, cost-effective ways um, of implementing it, saving money, and then really getting to that deployment phase and, and that saturation of the market. So um, now I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about talk to Mountain Growers um, and the technology um, that we're specifically implementing in this case. Um, we really feel like this is low-hanging fruit and uh, an opportunity to, uh, to bring things to the next level. 
Um, Kataki Mountain Growers uh, is 14 acres of greenhouses. I actually uh, believe that in the past few months um, they've actually expanded past 14 acres of, uh, of greenhouses. Um, and they really focus on wholesale greenhouse operations. So uh, they produce um, spring bedding plants, uh, fall pansies, hardy mums, um, and you know, more specialty plants that are then purchased by um, commercial landscapers who then install them across the state. Um, that's kind of an intro to them. Uh, the key point there is that uh, they have a lot of space that they need to um, control the climate of uh, throughout 12 months of the year. Not only for heating, also for, uh, uh, for cooling. So um, the goal here is um, replacing oil and propane heating systems. They also um, use animal fat. Um, and replacing that with an AFS energy systems biomass boiler system. Um, combined with the advanced pollution controls from um, Cambridge, who um, is here this evening, and, and I think both of, uh, actually AFS and Cambridge are both here, um, they can really kind of talk about their technologies and when we have more questions. Um, I can answer a few, but I, I feel like um, they're the real experts, it's their technology, so I'm going to allow them to answer some of the questions on the specifics of that. Um, but the, the real point is, um, you know, from our perspective, from MEA, is um, the and um, the cost that, that are really going to be taken advantage of here. Um, so a 73% efficient system um, compared to oil heating, compared to electric heating, um, you know, in, in some cases, um, as, well as, as well as propane, it's, it's vastly more efficient and much more cost effective. The pollution controls uh, clean particulate matter from the air, further reducing the environmental impact. Um, but the thing that I think really speaks to um, what we're looking to do here is, uh, and there's a little more on the pollution controls, is the economic analysis. Um, this is uh, a simple payback of 4.3 years. Um, when you compare that to some of the other renewable energy technologies out there, there's, there's really no comparison. Um, it's, I mean, the number's all out there. I, I don't need to, to bore you with some of the calculations, and, and we're kind of going through this, but that said, the, the real number there is, is on the right, the real numbers are on the right side of that. Um, if you're saving $700,000 a year, you don't really have, uh, have to make much of an argument outside of you know, a payback period of 4.3 years. So I won't spend too much time on that. Um, for us, the, the key goal here is, um, is, is implementation and replication. We want to make sure that this is a successful project um, that then can be used as a trophy to show other business owners, whether it be um, a community college uh, on the eastern shore that's currently heating with air source heat pumps. Um, showing them a case study that says, this is what we've done, these are the cost savings that we've, um, that we've, had, that we've realized, and more importantly, um, these are the barriers that we've identified, and here's how we've identified moving past those barriers. That can be um, a very effective tool for helping a facilities manager to decide that he's going to move forward with that next project. Um, and the next step is, is replication, um, and that's, that's really a thing that we're looking to, to go for. Um, the first step of that is implementing a successful project, but by buying down those first adopter costs and showing the values and the opportunities to these other institutions, um, providing lessons learned and, and kind of guiding these folks, uh, leveraging state uh, taxpayer funds uh, as well as our time, most effectively, we feel like we have a really good opportunity to work with industry in the state to create jobs, to create economic opportunity um, throughout the state and really use a resource that we feel has uh, been underutilized. So I'm gonna uh, pass it off to, to uh, Delhi Bazaar, and um, thank you guys very much. Thanks a lot. There'll be you know, time. We'll have plenty of time for questions. It's just a recording. So, uh, okay. we'll just kind of uh, move along. <laughs> Delegate uh, Heather Missouri represents Silver Spring, Tacoma Park, and the Maryland General Assembly. She's on the House Appropriations Committee. She is Vice Chair of the Education Economic <coughs> Subcommittee. She has led successful efforts to expand renewable energy and promote economic development and protect the environment. She's been involved in a number of things with uh, health coverage as well and the <coughs> government transparency. And, and she was the one in 2012 who championed successful efforts to create Maryland's first biomass. Uh, residential eating program. So uh, with that, I'll just uh, start with this here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. I apologize. Uh, I, 
I always crash after an election, and uh, I'm, I'm uh, struggling with my voice today. But um, speaking of the elections, you know, I got my start in politics uh, on Capitol Hill working for Joe Kennedy, who was Bobby Kennedy's oldest son. And when Bobby Kennedy uh, was in involved in politics, one of his best friends was a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist named John Siegenthaler from uh, Tennessee. And he liked to tell a story about how John got his start in politics. He, would, uh, he was a roving cub reporter covering a uh, governor's race in Tennessee. <clears throat> it was a re-election bid. And this new governor uh, didn't do a whole lot the first four-year term to get out and meet the, the people who were hard to reach in the more rural parts of Tennessee. So he thought he better do that during this re-election bid. And so John followed him one day on one of these tours. And to get to this little city called Mountain View, they had to go on a lot of back roads that weren't uh, paved. And it was really incredibly difficult to get there from Nashville. But at the end of the day, they get there. And there's a crowd of people because, hey, the governor doesn't visit Mountain View very often. And when the governor was done speaking, uh, getting ready to close his speech, he could tell people really weren't warming up to him all that much. So he finishes his speech by saying, and I promise you that the next time I return to Mountain View, there's going to be a four-lane highway from Nashville to the very top, tippy top of Mountain View. And the crowd goes wild. And he's kissing babies, and the moms are hugging him on his way out the door. He jumps into his... <clears throat> his uh, governor's detail, and they're on their way. Well, John Siegenthaler is in the truck with him. <clears throat> and uh, John says, um, excuse me, Governor, um, I know I'm new at this, but um, can you really justify a four-lane highway from Nashville to Mountain View? This really seems like a bald-faced political lie. And John looks at him, uh, the governor looks at him really seriously, and he says, John, if you're going to be any good at this business, you got to learn to cover what we politicians say. I said the next time I return to Mountain View, there's going to be a four-lane highway, and I'm never going back to that godforsaken place again. <laughs> so, thankfully the elections are over, um, and we don't have to, in these conferences, have a bunch of political speak. We get to dive back into the guts of good policy work. And I really want to thank all of you in this room for the advancements that we have been able to make on renewable energy uh, writ large in Maryland, but on our little corner of the world that, that we biomass enthusiasts have been able to uh, promote here in Maryland. And I can tell you it's really refreshing to be in a room with specifically a coalition of uh, wood energy aficionados because I, I, I can tell you when we first got started on this three years ago with General Assembly, uh, Richard Thomas of Cortland Hardware and I passed around a uh, bucket of wood pellets around the committee room where we had our biomass bill hearing. And most of my colleagues were picking the pellets up and smelling them to make sure they weren't rabbit poop. Um, and so we had, we had a lot of uh, education work to do with our colleagues over, uh, over the course of the last couple of years uh, to get them to engage and understand how biomass was unnecessarily being uh, left in the cold when we were ramping up and advancing all of our other uh, renewable portfolio options in the state. And uh, this conference, of course, couldn't come at a more critical time because uh, if we look down our uh, energy future path, whether we're talking the next five to ten years or even 20, 50 years and beyond, uh, our energy future in this state and our nation uh, has to be clean and renewable. We have set those guidelines in, in, and guideposts in, in our law already. And the only way we're going to meet our targets for reducing carbon emissions um, and getting 20% of our energy from renewables by 2022 is uh, by advancing the work of all, putting to work all of our renewable options, including biomass. Um, it's the only way that, uh, that we're going to be able to reduce the dependence on electricity. We have to cut that by 15% in the next year. And of course, we all are working on uh, nationwide a goal of, of having a redu reduced dependence on foreign energy to strengthen our economy and to protect our national security. 
If you visit Annapolis during session, you're going to hear a lot of buzz about a range of alternative energy options. We're talking about putting wind turbines off the coast of, of Ocean City. We're talking about solar panels on our neighbors' roofs. And we're talking about biomass stoves in your house and boilers in your children's elementary schools. Because clean renewable energy is here to stay. And of course, future generations are going to benefit from that. But the question is, how big of a role for biomass? And that's really going to be determined by you, by those of us in this room. Uh, we've got a lot of challenges that lay ahead of us to take what is a, an initial investment in a grant project and turn it into something even bigger and better. So I got started a little bit on the background of how we got to where we are. I got started on biomass in one of the most democratic ways that you can as a legislator, um, a discussion at a town hall meeting with constituents. Uh, John Ackerley from the Alliance for Green Heat is a, is a neighbor and has become a friend. And I first met him at a community coffee where we were talking about ideas for an upcoming legislative session. And he started pitching me on the fact that, um, that he had an idea that would help rural homeowners, rural homeowners, uh, who've largely been left out of the discussions when we were talking about um, uh, solar panels and geothermal options, but our rural homeowners uh, and, and some of our middle inc income families would have access to cheaper energy while also reducing our carbon outputs and it would also create opportunities for uh, drawing uh, new jobs to Maryland in this industry. He reminded me that our state had been too focused on the wind turbines and the solar panels and all of that is really critically important but we're not uh, we're not advancing every piece that we can to this alternative energy puzzle if we're not advocating for biomass. And I wasn't a hard sell on this issue. I grew up in rural Illinois, and um, I actually have a 34-acre farm on the eastern shore where I have a, a nice yodel uh, uh, stove in my own home, and I know really, really well. I get I get my girls inner Girl Scout going. I take all my um, uh, egg cartons and I fill them up with the lint from my dryer um, to use them as good uh, kindling for, for, my, uh, for my fire. And, uh, and I'm fortunate that I have a good stove with low emissions, but there are a lot of families in Maryland that don't similarly, similarly benefit. They're, they're equally relying on the stove to generate heat for their home, but they don't have uh, a, a, a system that is EPA certified as lowering the carbon emissions, and, and there's more that we can do to uh, to encourage that, and that's what John was talking to me about. But like I said, um, you know, and even within Tacoma Park, it was an easy sell. I represent Tacoma Park in Silver Spring in the General Assembly, but before that I was on the City Council in Tacoma Park. And while I was on the City Council, we actually built a corn silo on the Department of Public Works so that there would be a cooperative place for the corn necessary for all the growth in the corn burning uh, stoves that people were putting into their green energy homes in Tacoma Park. So we were really proud of you know, being on the cutting edge of, of biomass issues in Tacoma Park. But bringing this conversation to Annapolis was a whole other group of people that we had to uh, convince of its importance. And we were starting from scratch. Until this year, Maryland had focused entirely on programs for wind, solar, and geothermal. Uh, since 2005, our state had spent uh, $35 million on clean energy, but not a nickel on biomass. And so John and I got to work, and we introduced uh, a bill that we called the Renewable Energy for All Act to help Maryland homeowners purchase biomass heating systems. For three years, uh, he and many of you in this room collaborated with us to talk to any legislator who would listen about why Maryland needed to become a biomass state and why wood is an alternative uh, is a renewable resource. It isn't, um, uh, not a lot of people originally would think of wood as a renewable resource. And um, we started that conversation by reminding our colleagues that uh, the wind and solar and geothermal options, while incredibly important and we had to keep advancing those, were out of reach for many, many families in Maryland and that our existing clean energy grant programs weren't really doing much for middle class families that can't afford to purchase or lease solar panels that cost tens of thousands of dollars. And we talked about how biomass offers a cheaper renewable option for these families. 
and that modern stoves can be three to ten times cheaper on the front end while being just as much uh, carbon offsetting on the back end as solar. And that it would be especially helpful to rural families um, that have the most expensive heating sources like oil and propane and electricity, that they would be the ones most likely to utilize these grants. We called our bill the Renewable Energy for All Act because we truly wanted every Marylander to have the opportunity to participate in our clean energy future. We also talked about how the grant makes really good sense for our economy. It's one thing to do the right thing because it makes good policy sense. It's a whole other thing to be able to advance something that is good for creating Maryland jobs and creating niche industries within our own state. Small business hearth dealers like Richard Thomas from Bel Air and Suzanne Turner from Salisbury testified at our bill hearing about how important stove sales were for their bottom line. They know that the market uh, uh, they know this market best and they said that even modest incentives can help move more of their product through their stores. And then pellet producers like Stephen Fainer at American Wood Fibers talked at our hearings about wanting to expand the industry in Maryland, but that there needs to be a demand for these products in order to expand the industry. We tried to be as innovative as possible to make it happen, uh, promoting even initially uh, a tax on uh, luxury Duraflame firewood logs that people buy at Whole Foods or Lowe's where, you know, it, that's ambiance, right? You're not looking to heat your home with this. This is, you're running home, uh, you, you went to pick up a piece of fish and a nice bottle of wine for dinner and you want to have a romantic fire in the background. Let's tax those logs a little bit more and use it as a funding source to pay for, for these grants. Well, anytime you start trying to tax something in Annapolis, that creates a whole other uh, set of issues. And so <clears throat> we ran into some complications there, but slowly and surely we were able to win the case, mostly uh, in part because uh, we were gaining new allies within the Maryland Energy Administration as well. And they started saying that even if we're not able to move the bill through um, based on one or two vote margin, there was clearly enough education that had happened on this issue and enough support for advancing biomass that we would be able to get a pilot program up and running. And so with uh, the MEA's help, we did uh, create the first residential biomass heating program. So beginning September 1st, homeowners can now apply for grants to defray the cost of purchasing wood or pellet burning stoves. We have $50,000 set aside for this purpose. The grants are 30% of the cost of the stove or up to $400 for wood or $600 for pellet stoves. And as I mentioned earlier, the stoves have to meet EPA standards uh, for emissions and, and particulate output. So on the wood stoves, three grams per hour and the pellet stoves, two grams per hour. Um, but our ability to take this initial seed grant money on the belief that MEA had in the work we had done over three years to educate and advance this notion is not going to produce anything for us long term unless we're able to show the demand. We need your help to make sure that everyone out there knows about this program, is signing up for it, and ideally we have a waiting list of people who were able to get access to their grants this go around because fifty thousand dollars wasn't enough but i'm not going to be able to be your advocate on increasing those funding sources and creating a permanent home within the renewable energy uh, grant making authorities in the state if we're not able to make this pilot program successful so getting here was hard work and it took three years and hundreds of calls, letters, emails, and meetings with my colleagues. But what we do from here with this opportunity is going to be twice as hard um, because advocacy isn't easy. In a time of dwindling government resources and greater skepticism about clean energy investments, our challenge is going to be to take ownership and make the case for this energy resource. We have a challenge in front of us with this program, as I mentioned earlier. 
And in these tough budget times, the only programs that exist and are able to continue to move forward are the ones where we have the metrics to prove that there is a demand, a need, and a benefit that is uh, uh, benefiting not only the homeowners and the economy, but benefiting the environment as well. And we know that all of this can be proven if we get the word out there and get people lined up to take advantage of it. And so I ask for your help to spread the word to consumers, to get them signed up for these grants so that we can uh, work on doubling or tripling the funding in, in future sessions. We know why Maryland needs to become a leader in biomass. It's cheap, it's clean, it's renewable. It reduces our carbon footprint and leaves a clean environment for future generations. It creates jobs for dealers and small businesses, for installers, for wood and pellet producers, for foresters. It's something that can benefit all income levels across the board, every corner of Maryland, and it reduces our dependence on foreign energy. We know how to make the case, but no one's going to do it for us. We have to do it. And so I would ask, uh, as a piece of your homework, after getting all fired up here at the Wood Energy Conference, uh, to, uh, and I know some of you are fired up. I saw some wood ties here today, okay? So uh, we've got some real advocates here. I need you to call uh, your, your local council members. Make sure they know about it. It's a state grant, but you know, word on these issues trickle from the ground up and at the local and at the closest local level. Make sure that, that your county council commissioners or council members know about this so that they can get their constituents signing up for it. Call your delegates and your senators to ask them to do the same and to continue supporting this initiative moving forward. Thank Abby Hopper and her great colleagues at the NEA for standing up and, and believing in this uh, opportunity and setting up the pilot program and, and let her know we've got her back and that we're going to show that this can and will be successful. Um, we've got this far because advocates and industry leaders like you were willing to step out and be heard. You were willing to take ownership on this and now we want you to do it again but even ten times stronger. If we want wood stoves at every rural home, if we want biomass boilers in hundreds of schools, if we want wood and pellet producers to relocate to Maryland and not from Maryland, then let's commit ourselves today to the hard work necessary to make Maryland truly the leader in the biomass industry. And I appreciate everything you've done to bring us to this spot. We are at a really wonderful launch, part, uh, launch period for this work. And I want to come back next year celebrating the fact that we, uh, we whipped through this grant and nothing flat. We have a long line of people that are demanding for, for more and, uh, uh, investment and a growth in this industry. And uh, deeply appreciate all that you're doing to make this happen because it's incredibly important for Maryland and our energy future. Thanks for being here today. So, yes. Heather, if you want to sit up here and uh, oh. oops. have some questions. Thank you most for those presentations. I, I do have uh, one question that I think follows. I think it was Charlie's presentation first, and then flows directly into yours, and, and Abby's also. And that is, you mentioned speaking with the same voice. And in Maryland, along with many other states, you have one, I won't use the word problem, but I will use the word challenge. And that is conflicting mandates among different state agencies, specifically within MDE. There is a question about emissions and a specific standing rule that says there will be no wood boilers within the state within certain ranges by county. What is the best way that you see to solve both that problem as you're seeing the potential here and also with the International Energy Agency now saying the U.S. is going to export energy by 2035 more than we're using? <coughs> The challenge that natural gas is going to pose, even though this is renewable and affordable, and it's not. Um, so I, I think the, the first part of that is, um, and that I'll touch on, is, is kind of the MDE, as, as you've referenced. 
Um, there's a little bit of a challenge within the environmental community as a whole um, in understanding what our industry is trying to accomplish. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions, um, basically um, rooted from technologies from long, long past um, that currently are half as efficient um, as some of the technologies that companies like AFS, um, in conjunction with uh, technology from, from Cambridge and, and companies like them, in terms of particulate matter as well as in terms of efficiency. So I think one of the biggest challenges that as an industry we have, and I think in speaking as one voice, um, when we do have audiences with folks like NDE, with folks like some of the nonprofits throughout the state who advocate for um, you know, environmental improvement, um, I think communicating to them that we're all fighting for the same cause and introducing some of these technologies to them that really say, hey, not only is this very efficient, <clears throat> there's some technologies out there now that even uh, mitigates that beyond the efficiency goals that we have over you know, uh, replacing an air source heat pump. You know, I, I work very closely with, um, with Chesapeake College out on the Eastern Shore. They're currently heating um, most of their facility with air source heat pumps. Um, just doing a very simple math calculation with them, um, we've piqued their interest, not only in the technology, but also in kind of upgrading some of their other options whereas they were considering a lot of maybe more expensive technology. So that's, that's one of the ways I think that we can really speak to the environmental community and, and other agencies as a whole. And we've already begun having those discussions with MDE. So I think that's something that we started on, but really getting that um, argument, not just from MEA, but also from industry, also from legislators, also from the governor's office, that's one way to go about that. The natural gas challenge is, is considerable. And it's, it's not just um, for the bioenergy industry, it's, it's the renewable energy industry as a whole. Um, that is a challenge that I think the entire industry is scrambling to address. Um, I think there are a lot of avenues, especially in cases like bioenergy, where um, in Western Maryland and the Eastern Shore, there's no access to the infrastructure. And I think that's one major advantage that we have. So that's, that's I'll go to that. On the on the regulatory front, um, <laughs> It is not impossible to bring the agencies together to collaborate on uh, on an updated viewpoint on on where we need to go with some of these things. By way of example, um, a year or two ago, another issue that I had taken on was trying to improve the ability for Maryland and both the residential and commercial capacity for improved composting. And if you take a look at our existing regulations, they were in multiple agencies, across the board, confusing, conflicting, didn't work, um, and we were eliminating the opportunity to, to use composting as, as an economic tool as well to bring more jobs into Maryland by having Maryland do a better job at having large-scale industrial composting opportunities. And it was purely from a regulatory environment. And so we went in with the specific goal of pulling together a massive task force of people from the various agencies with a, um, a list of all the competing uh, rules and regulations. And sometimes, I mean, the, our agencies are incredibly hardworking. Um, the budgets are really awful. They don't have the support that they need. The amount of work that we ask them to do for the amount of resources and FTEs to be able to do it don't match up. And sometimes, uh, you know, in just running to try to keep up with what uh, the day-to-day -day is, they don't have time to sit and look and say, oh wow, our composting regulations, you know, are out of whack and they're not in line with the other two agencies that are looking at some other form of composting. It takes us in the advocacy community to highlight and pinpoint what those problems are and then to work with the agencies in a way to um, direct a vision for how to update and, and collaborate to, to get a new response. And in the case of the boilers, we just have new science on our side, right? I mean, the, the case where a lot of these regulations were put into place, it, it predates the technology that we have now to uh, rewrite those standards. And so I'm committed to working with you. I've had some experience in working with the agencies to be able to do that already. And, uh, and, and I will continue working with you. But I need your expertise 
as well. I mean, in the same way that the agencies are running around crazy, I'm also running around on a lot of different issues, and I don't pretend to be the expert on everything, but I do listen to the experts, and I value when you bring me input on what we can do to make government work better on your behalf. That's what we're here for, and that's what the agencies are here for as well. And so we just have, that's why having conferences like these are incredibly helpful so that we can open these lines of communication and bring forward your ideas and implement solutions that are going to be win-win for Maryland, for our economy, for our private sector that's working to, to help us do this. On the natural gas front, <clears throat> I have had a lot of frustration with that as well. Um, I've been, you know, on a separate measure, I have been leading the charge of making sure that Maryland uh, does this in a pragmatic way, that if we are to drill it all in Maryland, that we only do it um, if it can be proven to be done safely and not without the environmental, uh, public health, and economic impacts that we've seen in other states that have drilled first and asked questions later. Personally, I don't think that in order to accept a, a, as a, a, a homegrown energy supply and the jobs that supposedly come along with it, that we have to accept flammable tap water and earthquakes and livestock kills as just a normal course of doing business and that there is a way that this can be done better with independent, robust scientific review. While that's pending, and, and while Maryland is taking this more pragmatic course, um, as we've seen across the country, the explosion in, in the drilling, the, the, the primary frustration has been that uh, renewables saw a huge uptick when, you know, we're also price sensitive to energy, right? And when it becomes really super expensive, then we start to get people talking about conservation. And then we get to have them talk about renewables. And now all of a sudden, um, that that price pressure has been brought down because of the flood of natural gas available, then the economic incentives that had been at work that make the wind turbines come together and the grants and and all of the industries come together to say we want to do this start to get a little bit more shaky. And I think it's incumbent upon all of us to do our best in our spheres of influence to keep banging the alternative energy drum because you know there's not just a, a limitless supply and we also know that even if we get at that Saudi Arabia's worth of natural gas, it's not all for homegrown purposes as you said. We're already seeing them really look to export it. And so what do we need to do for our own homegrown energy supplies? How does that benefit our economy? And how can we add the conservation piece into the dialogue as well? I was just curious, how um, since, since this began on September 1st for the wood stove, how many so far have been utilizing your grant? Because I'm guesstimating if you take 500 people, Five hundred dollars being the average as like thousand people, and um, I was just wondering, did you say the fifty thousand did come from the tax for the door flank, or that was something that was not well received? And the third thing is, is there a fact sheet, brochure, web link, something available so when we go back to our local council members, county commissioners, delegates, we can say, here, go right here, and here's the little flyer, and or if I have to go into my local stove store right now, would they say? hey, you can do this, look up here on the wall, we've got this brochure. Sorry. Um, I hope I, I, keep that microphone because I, I want to make sure I get to all the points. <clears throat> we, we did not end up taxing the Durham Flames, so we didn't have, and what I was att uh, attempting to do originally was to set up our own ongoing grant program to do this permanently and for there to be a funding source to fund it long term. And when we weren't able to do that, because we did, we're in an environment here in Annapolis where you can't create a new grant program long term unless you have a funding source for it. And we ran into a buzzsaw related to, uh, it was more, it was less legislators unwilling to do it, and it was more problematic uh, questions coming out of the, uh, the comptroller's office on how to implement it, how to collect that tax differently and implement it. So there were, there were problems that came up with that identified funding source. So as that started to happen, <clears throat> we contemplated pushing to then just make biomass a part of the existing uh, uh, grant programs that the state was already investing in geothermal and solar. Part of the concern in just making it a permanent part was that 
the demand already has been proven on solar and geothermal, and there already isn't enough money in those pots to, to, to meet that demand. So how do you add in yet a, a third component that would draw on resources with, without new money? And the compromise that we came up with with support of NEA was to do a one-time pilot project to show the demand and the importance and, and how it would work. And so that's where we got the $50,000. And that's where I was saying if we don't have your help in taking uh, the flyer, which I believe does exist on NEA's website. Uh, am I right about that, John? Yeah. Um, I knew that we had worked on creating one at one point. It's on somebody's website. Uh, probably the Alliance for Green Heat has it and the Maryland Energy Administration. Um, and that's where you can also apply and get information about the, the grant program. But Part of it is it's only September. Uh, I mean, it just started in September. I, I would have thought the demand could have potentially eaten that 50000 up by now, even in mid-November, but it hasn't been the case. In part, um, it's because of uh, uh, installation costs. Uh, a lot of low- and middle-income uh, uh, households want to access the grant but want to install the new stove on their own to save on the installation cost. And that is uh, one of the prohibitions related to the, uh, to the, the grant. So we're working on a few hurdles that way right now. But um, we could really use your help in making sure that people do know that this program exists and is out there. Okay, with that, thank you very much for your time.